experience with WordPress multi-site, um, basically thinking through, um, you know, how you might use WordPress multi-site or how you are using WordPress multi-site to support a community of tens, hundreds, thousands of publishers. Um, and so given that uh, I started talking and uh, I'm hoping others will, I'll give you a little bit of my background with WordPress multi-site and then we can share other people who want to chime in and talk about what they've done. Um, so back in 2006, uh, I started a prototype for what would be UMW blogs with WordPress multi-site. And it's actually interesting because around that time, there was someone at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who was forked WordPress and had kind of created a WordPress multi-site system, but it wasn't WordPress, what was known at the time as WordPress multi-user or MPMU. They had created their own and I was using that for a minute and I probably have blog posts about it. But soon after WordPress announced WordPress.com and WordPress.com is obviously the most notable WordPress multi-site instance in that it's a single WordPress database that can run thousands, tens of thousands, probably in the case of WordPress.com, millions of sites. And um, that was something that we started at UMW. It became known as UMW Blogs to support well over 10,000 faculty, students, and staff to do everything from create like student sites, the newspaper, journals, course sites, um, portfolios. I liked WordPress a lot and I like WordPress multi-site a lot because it was, you know, protean. It could basically be anything because you could use various plugins, themes, etc. And so that was in 2006, seven, we officially announced UMW Blogs and that platform, Shannon, who's not here, but usually is, can attest is still running. They're gonna, because it's a little bit long in the tooth, like some of those who started it, they're kind of like retiring it in order to bring on what they're calling UMW sites, but it's basically a fresh start of the same thing for their community. So that's one instance of a WordPress multi-site um, that I think for me, the greatest thing about WordPress multi-site, it was easy for at least one or two of us to manage and to scale for an entire community of faculty and staff and students who needed that, right? who had a need for that. And one of the questions that comes up and it may come up today is why that versus something like your own WordPress site in a cPanel environment. And so that's an interesting question if anyone wants to talk about that. But regardless, um, that's my backstory of WordPress multi-site. I still think it was the single most kind of utilitarian and powerful tool, open source tool that I've used as a as a kind of ed tech in that in that context and led to a lot of very interesting stuff at UNW. Anyway, I've said enough. I think it's kind of interesting, like, um, so I threw in the chat, like, I didn't even really consider the fact that WordPress.com is kind of a WordPress multi-site, like, before you drew that connection, um, just because of the scale of it, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, it is interesting to me um, to, to think about, like, how, like, I, I would really love to hear from their, someone on their team at Automatic of like what what if this gets into WordPress multi-site and improves that or what do we take from like how that relationship works I guess as a person who's just kind of always curious about how open source software uh how it goes over its lifespan and stuff like that um because yeah I didn't even really think of that um as a WordPress multi-site but of course it is um I feel like the the um the other, the interesting thing to me about multi-site, and this is not something I really appreciated until I started at Reclaim and kind of saw what folks are doing with it, is like how much you can scale a multi-site, like how big, how many sites, how many people using it, how long they can use it, um, while keeping that maintenance kind of at a single level the whole time, right? Like there's not, you don't need, you know, a uh, you don't need 10 servers to provide 40,000 sites, right? Like you can do that 
with one big multi-site install if you really want to. Um, and that's really fascinating to me, especially as someone who before this worked at a place where it's much smaller scale. So I, I wasn't really used to encountering those kinds of numbers. Um, like my, most of my experience with multi-site before I started Reclaim was retiring multi-sites and moving them into domain of one's own as individual C panels. So I was kind of like, yeah, I guess you could do that. But seeing how much you can do with a little on a multi-site is insane. And, and, and by a little, I mean, server wise, but also like support time wise, like you don't have to be, you can, you can keep that up and running for users for such a long time. And with so many people with relatively little work. Interesting. Ed just brought up the idea of um, Jetpack. And one of the things Shannon, who I keep on talking about Shannon, um, I'm sorry, Shannon, but talked about recently at one of our WordPress multi-site sessions is she went into wordpress.com to help someone and literally like could not recognize it anymore <laughs> as a WordPress multi-site. Like it was such a different experience. I don't know if anyone's had that experience with WordPress multi-site or wordpress.com, the differences, but like it literally is a morph of its own thing. And I think Jetpack and the various tools they built around it and how they using React and JavaScript to build that has, has been defining and that being its own ecosystem, like literally. And based on WordPress multi-site, but a long way from, from that reality. Yeah, Taylor and I got into it one day where we were talking about the differences between automatic and WordPress. Um, I made I made a comment where I was like, oh, I really like suggesting the automatic themes to my users because often they're set up to be super simple and really easy to be moderately successful with very quickly because that's the WordPress.com business model. And, and seeing a separation between what automatic does as WordPress.com and what WordPress.org does is sometimes interesting because many of the very user focused features get implemented first on WordPress.com because they're trying to simplify, simplify, simplify. Yeah. And it, it's kind of, it, it makes a lot of sense too, in terms of like open source projects in general, you often have like a need for more like user interface design folks. There's often like a lack of that. Um, and to see that obviously a company like automatic that is selling it's very different relationship to the product, right? Um, it's a product, I guess, fundamentally for, you know, um, that it's kind of cool to see that, that I think works in both directions, a good way for folks using WordPress, right? Like you get this folks that these folks that are really interested in developing that and making sure that that's easy to use and whether or not we agree with all their decisions. <laughs> um, and you get this open source foundation that is, making sure the technical core is really good and, and it's portable and you can move it multiple places and host it multiple places. That's the really cool thing. And that's kind of why, like, it's interesting to me, like for multi-site in particular, there's not really anything like WordPress multi-site that it's not, it's not like there's ghost multi-site, right. Or, or, I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong. I guess there are like a lot of like proprietary CMSs that like campuses use for, and that's kind of like WordPress multi-site, but not really in that they don't usually aren't intended for folks to have the a level of control an individual get, user gets in multi-site. Um, so that's really kind of cool. I have an instructor that uses, it's either Wix or Weebly. I, I stopped paying attention after the W because it's not open source. Um, <laughs> uh, that has similar controls to WordPress multi-site, has kind of admin controls over their students' blogs and, and can do that. So we see those structures other places um, that, that I think is interesting. I also am thinking now of there's definitely CMSs that are specifically dedicated to portfolio sites and I wish I was looking into them um, at Carlton when we were transitioning away from WordPress multi-site and looking at other options and I wish I could remember the name of the one that I 
just looking at it. I'm going to Google it and put it in the chat and see if I can find it. But Digication. education sounds right. But the idea of it was being used by um, one of the Alaska the state universities in Alaska, and it was huge. And so I think that they really liked that they could have a lot of control over it. But again, that, that was something that I believe was proprietary. Yeah. And, and so, so often those platforms like live text is a big one um, or watermark. I don't remember what it's called anymore. Uh, that might be the company, but um, I was always not a big fan of those because you usually are trading. It's like, yeah, we don't have to administer this basically at all. Like it's just handled for us. And then often, not always, but often it becomes not very valuable to the student making the portfolio anymore because they don't get any flexibility in how it looks and how they tell their story. It's just like, yeah, I can upload PDFs here and put my name on it. And that's what it is. And that is always such a bummer to me because it's like, okay, well, why are we doing these portfolios? Is it just for program assessment? Because do they even need to be websites if that's all it's for, you know? Oh, and I always like how interested. flexible multi-site yeah. gives. I'd like to make a comment, uh, Taylor. Um, I'm Laurie Miles. I uh, manage the WordPress multi-site at UNC Asheville. Hi, Laurie. Hey, Jim. How are you? Um, and it's great to see like faces with the names because I've seen names <laughs> through emails and reclaim hosting and stuff and support. But I will say that one of the things I'm challenged with is uh, the fact that the students who are doing um, are using our WordPress sites have all different levels of expertise in dealing with website building tools. And one of the things that we offer is this WordPress <clears throat> site that they can practice on. So one thing I find that when I look at or go to meetings about WordPress, it's highly web developer, um, well, web developer uh, attended. And so I have to say, Taylor, the simpler, the better for our students and our faculty. And one thing that I'm concerned about is I'm seeing WordPress transition the next upgrades. Some of the stuff is really complicated. And I don't think the students or the faculty are interested in doing these like, like the full editing stuff. And so I've kind of cut that off in, in the, uh, the newest versions and not made it available because it would be so complicated for them to use. And I think that's one thing that is important as web developers, you gotta remember that if you're giving students or novices an ability to play around with a web tool, then they need to kind of not deal with the most complicated stuff, especially a student, because they'll just get all wrapped up in the technology and not actually do the assignment or they get lost in the assignment. So I hope I'm making sense and I don't know where to go with it. Um, I'm a little concerned about the direction that WordPress is going, tr truthfully. I'm, yeah, I'm glad you said that because that that is definitely, I first of all, I agree with you, right? Like, because the the complexity for for lots of people can get in the way, right? Um, and we've it's definitely come up at these community chats about the the direction of WordPress and full site editing and like Gutenberg too, just like the the you know the post editing and page editing, um, because a lot I think a lot of us I think share that concern of like, hey, this is not you know, not for everybody, clearly. Um, so yeah, I, and that, that is something I'm always kind of curious about is like, how can you make that a clean on-ramp? Um, and some of it we don't always have control over as admin. Some of it we have to like, be like, no, we're just, that's not ready yet. And we're not gonna make that available. Um, Cause I, I, I would say I 100% agree with you, especially on full site editing. Like I, I think if I was, um, doing this, especially for student portfolios or something like that, I, I would make the default theme just not one of those themes because I don't think it's ready yet for everyone. I would maybe think about having it available as an option and say like, yeah, you could use this and here's some information about it if you want to, but this isn't going to be our, our default. Um, and I am really interested to see how Automatic and WordPress, the WordPress community, like continue down that and make that better and more palatable. But I'm also interested to see about like 
where like it's to me disappointing that 2022 is the default theme i think that is not a great choice personally but 2019 I, isn't so great either taylor nope i haven't liked the last couple of WordPress <laughs> things i think uh what was the one with the plant um, <laughs> 2017. um 2017 2017 that was a great one let's still you know um but uh so th- i i disagree with that choice but i think it's it's kind of hard because i think for a lot of the wordpress like open source community they're still thinking of wordpress as like well the person who installed this set up a database and put all these files in it's like mm, i don't know if that's the majority of people using data uh, wordpress um certainly not the people i t- work with and talk to but yeah your your point i just wanted to, to follow up on what Lori said I'm sorry, because it was exactly a conversation I had with a fellow kind of uh, ed tech enthusiast yesterday. She put out on a public discussion forum that we use across SUNY, hey, we're starting to look at ePortfolio programs. Now this person's located at Geneseo. So they already have two WordPress multi-sites. They've got an open lab and they've got a vanilla WordPress multi-site. Um, um, and... I responded to it and I just said, Hey, you know, we use open lab. I'm very happy with it. Next month, we've got Charlie Edwards coming to campus from the city tech group, part of the group that develops the open lab. But I think there's two strong arguments against using WordPress as your portfolio system. And the first argument against that I would say is that it's messy. You can make a bad looking WordPress site but I don't think you could make a bad looking digication site. I would counter that and say, I don't think you could make a really great looking digication site. Um, And you could make a really good WordPress site, but I think I see more bad WordPress sites than I see really good WordPress sites. You know, when I see a really good one, I'm like, Ooh, this person has a little bit of talent in this. And then the second thing is the data. A lot of people buy these as like the upstream data middle states compliance systems and WordPress is just never going to do that. And, and as much as I hate that conversation, I can't ignore it. If I want to keep serving my campus, I hate that when, when, when education decisions are made completely on data, but I, I can't ignore that. I have to find solutions for that. If I want to keep the type of solutions that I want available, available to the campus. I think yeah, I've talked. I'm oh, sorry. I would just say, I mean, to Lori, to your point, and I think a tangent, Ed, to yours is like WordPress for the for the web developer. It seems to be that direction when you see some of the themes and and the Gutenberg. And there is the choice people, many people who run WordPress multi sites here, might have to make. Like, how do I support these new tools like Gutenberg and Full Site Editor, and also and that's like on a case by cases. I'd be interested to see like, you know, what questions you're getting. Are you getting people who are saying, I want the full side editor? Like, how is that transition going? Because I think that's a shared pain, Lori. So I'd love to know, A, how you're doing it and other people who manage WordPress multi-site. Like, what is your approach to the, is it just, you know, like WYSIWYG, old school editor, classic editor done or what? No, I, I definitely um, support the Gutenberg editor um, with the students, but I, when I look at some of these things like the full um, site editing or whatever, it just, it's complicated to me. So for a, a, someone who's a novice or brand new to WordPress to throw them that kind of instructions it's it's just beyond it, it's it's a it's not necessary for them to get a feel for what WordPress is about and building websites is about and communicating on the web, and so um, I don't I'm not necessarily getting any particular questions. I'm mostly just looking at the new stuff that's coming and going. Mm, that's just way beyond what they are going to be happy with. Now I know our um, our campus actually uses WordPress for their campus. Uh, website and they've just cut off all of it. I mean, it's just the classic editor. They've cut everything else off. So it's just easy for, and for them to keep it updated and, and other people to use it when they're building their own like department sites. 
And one of the things I just uh, put in the chat here too, um, I really liked what Tom and Pilot were saying yesterday in the session around, you know, being really strategic or particular around, around how many plugins you're bringing in uh, to have various solutions. So not overboarding your dashboard with four site editors, which of course we all know can be quite heavy in and of themselves. So compiling them on top of each other, you know, but as a, a larger instance, um, you know, sticking with one or two solutions. And then the the conversation with folks is, this is what we can support in-house. Here's our solution for what you're trying to do. And if you want to run another tool, you know, let's maybe consider um, a single instance of WordPress and cPanel or something else. So you're still sort of providing offerings within the parameters of the multi-site, but you're not letting it go further than what you can support because ultimately you want to keep these instances sustainable. Um, so that was something that, that I really liked from yesterday's conversation. Um, and the other thing I wanted to raise too uh, is, you know, I think with WordPress multi-site conversations, it's really easy to start talking about the very large institutional WordPress multi-sites or, you know, the big legacy instances that, you know, are just very big ships to move. Uh, but the other thing I am interested, maybe at some point we can talk about is, you know, how faculty or individual users are, might have their own multi-sites for course organization, um, you know, and when you have users that are considering hosting multiple single WordPress instances versus having their own multi-site to manage courses semester after semester. So I'm not sure if that's something that you all see or if you're really just more using WordPress multi-site at a larger scale. I think Robin. a really nice example that I saw was a conference that used a WordPress multi-site so that they had a domain for each year so they could leave the past years alone and just keep picking a new modern theme each year without changing the old one. I thought it was really simple and really elegant way to like allow each year to have its own identity while still just being on the same WordPress install. I was writing in the chat, but that's a, a good idea and maybe something that Reclaim should do, given we have a couple of domains conference sites that are out there floating that I think we've flattened into static HTML for some, but, you know, we could probably consolidate that a bit more. So I like that for events, too. I, um, at one point, um, had used it for uh, supporting a class that had, like, 10 people every year take it. It's a small class, but every year they wanted to add, like they wanted to make a resource at throughout the course of the year on a particular topic. And they all, each of them had a different topic. And so the point of the multi-site was they would log in, just get a site, start writing. And then at the end of it, it stayed there because the next year's class would build on top of it. Um, and that was a pretty good resource, or I think it was a pretty good use case for multi-site because um, it allowed me to really focus on making that like, what, and they, they did that for a couple of years. And I don't think the person teaches that class anymore, but like that, that was great because I was able to invest the time in being like, like I set up single sign-on for it, like, and it was not a huge multi-site. I think there was maybe 30 sites, but like at, throughout the, the use of it. But it was like really fast for folks to get started with. And, I, you know, I picked like three themes and I was like, if these are if you're unhappy with these, here's my email address. But maybe just make one of them work for you. And they were all pretty simple themes and it let people do some cool stuff. And then, you know, it was ultimately like they were publishing something on the Web, but they didn't have to think too hard about the design of it. Yeah, and there's a good some good questions in the chat too around themes and stuff like that. Like, Robin, I know when we did UMW blogs, we probably had 150 themes, and um, that was that was interesting. M, please uh, jump right in. I don't mean, but there's some good questions in the chat, so follow up on those. I'd love to. M, go for it. It's good to see awesome. you. Your green backup is awesome. Oh yeah, that's a uh, that's my paint. <laughs> I chose green. It's like my house uh, has all kinds of colors in it. 
and we decided all of that paint like there's green here in the living room our kitchen is yellow we have uh my partner's workroom is like black and yellow we have blues it's it's a rainbow over here it's cool um but anyways i think annika did you have your hand raised okay um i was just going to piggyback off taylor's example um, we have used multi-site or WordPress multi-site for just individual cases. Um, usually faculty teaching a course on e-portfolios and having students set up their e-portfolios within that site so that the faculty member can control the themes and the plugins that they use. And we talked about um, approved plugins versus um, network a, a network activated versus just uh, plugins to install for specific portfolios. Um, and that makes it easy for just that one case. I have not done a WordPress multi-site for the entire institution, although I think it would be helpful just to have those one-off portfolios for students who just want to create something and then take it out. Um, one of the issues that we did run into is rights to ownership of of that site does it it's student created content so it, they have the right to their own content however it is owned by the faculty member so i go through a process of getting it approved by if the student wants to take it out if they want a copy of their site they can obviously get that but if they want it removed from the site after they're done with the class or they graduate I go through a process of saying, um, I've talked to the student. We also need to talk to the faculty member since they're the one owning it. And um, of course it's approved by the institution if they want to remove it. Um, so I'm curious if anyone else has run into that issue um, of rights and uh, ownership. I had run into something similar, but mine, where it was this in this particular example, wasn't a multi-site, but it was students making um, portfolios on their own cPanel accounts for a class. And most of them, I think, were in like their own, like a new WordPress install. And at the end of it, because in this particular case, the, the faculty member was like, this will be great because they can make it their own way. They can integrate it in their own way. They're all about that. I think it was for communications. So it was pretty relevant to the types of work they were doing. That was awesome. But then at the end of it, they're like, well, we really need these to exist for program assessment, like in for a while, right? Like even if the student wants to delete it. And so we ended up using like archiving tools to make copies that weren't even public. So it was like, all right, here, here's a copy. Here's a zipped up folder of what it is. If you ever need it, you can unzip it and open up the file and it'll view it in your browser. And that worked okay for that situation. Um, but it can be really tricky with that. Like, is this my content if I create it in your space? Like it's so situational. And obviously everyone has different thoughts about that too. Like I, I typically end up on the, like, I usually want to give students whatever rights I can, right? Like, and say like, no, you made this, you should be able to delete it too. That's a valid choice. Um, but um, that was, that worked well for that situation is saying like, let's keep a copy of this, but it doesn't necessarily have to be public. Um, but yeah. Just bouncing off of that, uh, Taylor, I have actually been on the opposite end of that, um, which is when I was, a student at Carleton, we, I was working with a faculty member. Uh, I was taking a portfolio capstone centered on digital humanities, digital work, and how that sort of thing is presented online for a very young program. It was the first time that that capstone had been uh, offered. And so when I left Carleton, I ended up pulling, it, it wasn't in a multi-site, it was WordPress in a domain of one's own uh, cPanel. And I ended up 
getting basically a zip copy of that, taking it with me, and then I could rewrite it and update it and make it my own professional site, which was the general idea. But that's still out there because the professor has keeps really tight control over his cPanel and really wanted that content to stay both for assessment and for future examples. And because that was sort of the philosophy of showing off your digital work and leaving your footprint, which is an interesting conversation about having ownership over your digital work in the end um, that I was not brave enough to have with a guy who was handling my grades at the time. But. Yep. That's the really tricky thing. I think I know who you're talking about, Pilot. Yeah, I think you do. <laughs> but yeah, um, usually when you talk about archival in general or keeping something around to have it preserved, you know, usually what's to follow is permissions for that, right? Or giving folks an opportunity to opt in to keep their, their stuff or to opt out. And um, that becomes very tricky, especially since every software is different, right? Just uh, on my WordPress multi-site, um, I have published press permissions on. Um, it's a it's a plugin that you can edit the permissions on a single subsite. And it's I've got the way I've got this set up is only I can turn it on. But when I one of the use cases I use it for is I change the role ability of authors so that authors can see private posts. And what I do that for is if I allow authors to be able to see private posts, I can tell a student if you mark it private in the WordPress multi-site, now this will be seen only by your classmates like it was a Blackboard discussion board or more of a closed LMS. And if you choose to miss say unprivate, now this is available to the entire um, community. And so I'm trying to like, I'm hacking the permissions a little bit to try to make both a, a, a real choice for closed versus open. Those kinds of tools, like that ability to even, you described it as a hack, right? But like, but it, it is and it isn't in that, like it isn't, it is, there isn't like a built-in WordPress way to edit the user roles, but there are a million plugins to do it. And you could theoretically write your own if you really wanted to. And that is one of the, I think to me, the most fascinating thing is that you can walk, you can, you can create that spectrum in a multi-site in almost any way you want and any way your students and faculty need in a way that would be, you could do it in individual C panels, but you would have to have like documentation about this is the plugins you need to install. And you can actually make that pretty easy in a multi-site. That's really fascinating to me. And and even going the opposite way too. Like I know um, Tom in the the WordPress multi-site workshop has mentioned a couple times how Rampages has like a on the homepage, like all blog posts that are public are just there that you can see. I think that's maybe a feature of Open Lab too. Um, like bringing that content together into a network is doable because it's, you know, one WordPress install with one database. So that is, I think, one of the most cool things to me about multi-site is that you have that, those tools um, to imagine almost anything along that spectrum between nobody can see it and everybody can see it. Yeah, I guess just to clarify, all the students are on our, in roles on the same single site. I'm not modifying it so they can see their sites between sure. different ones. Yeah, but you could, right? Like technically you could do that if that's a thing you wanted. And Open Lab um, does that. Yeah. You can you you have five you have five security levels. You can make it private just to admins, private just to people with the roles on the site, private to the community, world public, world public, and encouraged to be crawled on the robots.txt file. So that's the five levels that they've built into their system. And so what we do is we we push into the class, we teach them about those levels of permissions and also bring a librarian with them, us who teaches them about Creative Commons licensing at the same time to try to think about how open should your work be and what are the implications of that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. At that point, it's really about getting people to understand the options they even have and 
probably landing on three, four, five good options and say, these are the plays, these are the places we recommend you land, right? Because when every choice is a choice, that's obviously overwhelming. Or every choice is an option that's overwhelming. But landing on a few that make sense for your use case and then explaining them and what that means um, and what they may want to be considering is the conversations I love to see students have or be confronted with, but um, have to be done well <laughs> for them to mean anything. I'm actually thinking we're going to be talking about site archiving soon, maybe next week. And I'm thinking about, uh, Taylor, you talked about, you had a stream last week talking about flattening sites in general to static HTML. Um, and I was wondering if anyone wanted to, has done archiving work in a major sense or in a smaller sense on their WordPress multi-site, what the process for that looked like, and yeah. Or what? not on a multi-site, that would be interesting. But I have done some archiving. Unfortunately, HTTrack is not an approved tool that we can use at Carleton. I talked to our um, security chief officer and he said that it's not something that we should use because it has vulnerabilities. So he recommended SiteSucker. And I'm a Windows user. So I I, I was so upset. But uh, Well, if you want help, I can send you a special wget command that should work on Windows. So um, we can talk about that in Discord. OK. Um, but. Um, so yeah, I've used a uh, site sucker on my iPad to um, flatten and archive um, dynamic sites and send those to uh, students who want a copy of their site. I've also used Web Recorder on some very low um, websites that don't have a lot of information. Um, and I'm also working with our institution's archive commons librarians and they're using a tool called archive it um, that they have their own um, budget for and they it's a crawler that you can go through any site and direct it to go to additional domains um, and so we're in the process of talking about how to archive institutional student work so that it is more accessible to students um, when they want a copy of their site versus just emailing me saying that they want um, their stuff. Archive it is the one that may basically is the Wayback Machine, right? Yeah, um, it uses the Wayback Machine, but it um, you can command it to crawl either um, an automated annual process or just once. And I, from what I heard, Archive It, um, with their financial process, they don't charge if you crawl the same site um, over and over again. They just do for new domains. We have a process, it's uh, very manual <laughs> um, because we have a lot of users um, and we uh, in our sites, um, in our system, our multi site. And so, what um, the system we have in place is that we go into our banner student information system database and we gather a, um, we basically get a CSV file. Um, of current students um, and then we compare that to our users in WordPress and so the users that are no longer in WordPress are, are, are you know no are, that are still in WordPress but are no longer in our banner system have probably graduated so we kind of have this manual system of 
weeding out those um, users who are no longer at the university because we only support their WordPress sites while they're at um, our university. And so then we can take those to those users. Um, um, we don't, I think, no, no, no. We just uh, not delete them, but we, um, what's the right word? Um, we deactivate them. I think is how I think is what it is. But then we take their sites <clears throat> and we actually export them as a zip file and put them on a on a separate server. So, or maybe we deactivate the sites. Anyway, there's a whole process where we basically look at what students are still uh, still there and which ones are all already left the university, and we basically deactivate their sites. If they come back to the university or want, you know, email us and want their site um, carry on to another WordPress instance, then we can, um, we can give them that backup of their site. And that's kind of how we do it. Is that, did that answer your question? Someone Sorry, uh, but answered sort of what I was curious about, um, definitely. That, that does sound really manual and I'm, but I, I, if it works for you, like, hmm. I have not, I need to confess that I have not had to do major archiving for a WordPress multi-site. So mostly what I'm curious is just how people do it and how they think about those processes. Can I ask you, Lori, what's what's in the zip file? Is it just the WP export? Is it all the media files? Does it have? Um, I actually, I try to grab everything um, when we, um, let's see, I think there's a plugin <laughs> that allows you to grab the media as well. Because, yeah, if not, when you just get the, and this is the tricky part to me about exporting WordPress sites, is that a lot of times it'll, it'll link back to the original site. Um, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so it's better to export the whole thing. And to be honest with you, I haven't done it in a while, so I couldn't tell you exactly what all's in it. But I, I do try to get everything um, so that it, it links to the correct, to the media that's in the backup. That makes sense. I, I've definitely run into that too. Like you can use the built-in, uh, is it JSON file? And if you're using that to like migrate, like you're, exporting that and installing WordPress someplace else and using that file. Now WordPress will offer to pull over media when you do that. But of course the original has to exist for it to be able to do that. Um, so that file on its own is just the text in your posts, obviously. So um, uh, you probably, I don't know what plugin you use, but I, I know some folks use updraft for that. Um, and I think that works pretty well. Um, and there's um, probably a lot of other options. Um, and uh Oh, XML. Yes, you're right. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that it can be a really tricky one. Um, and I, I always kind of feel like it's, it's difficult. I always have a hard time when, cause I had some, some instances where folks will say, I want a backup of my site. And sometimes you have to kind of poke at that question a little bit and say, well, what do you, what do you mean? Like, what do you want here? If I give you a database dump and the entire files, all of the files that is a very complete backup but you may not be able to do anything with it right like depending on what you want to do maybe you want to look at it on your computer without publishing it anywhere and that will be tricky for i mean you can do it right but like that would be less useful than uh maybe a web recorder ar archive or something so that was always kind of a tricky thing so you, you have to land on one for a process right where you're archiving lots of sites but then every once in a while I get questions from individuals and I sort of eventually developed like a series of questions of like, how do you want to view this? And cause it's, it's tricky. If you phrase it the wrong way, people will say, well, I want to do all of those things. And you go say, well, um, I'm only going to do one of them for you. So <laughs> you have to pick. Hey, it's Robin here. Um, 
I'm just I'm just wondering if there is a way to automate like the archival process here a little bit. So I mean, Lori mentioned that you know she does a manual process of when a, when a student um, is no longer at the university or in college that they just manually do a backup of the site. I'm wondering if there is some sort of plugin that will allow you to back up um, their site, like if it hasn't been touched in X amount of time, um, it probably means that they, they're probably not here anymore. Um, I'm wondering if there is a tool that does that. I'm not personally aware of one that would do one on a schedule like that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, you could theoretically kind of string a couple tools together because you can, um, you could via the database um, and it would require a little bit of programming and stuff, but you could theoretically look at the database and say like, okay, which of these sites haven't been updated since X day? And then, you know, uh, script that to do something. But um, it would also be a little tricky because you'd also have to have some way to mark, well, we don't ever want to disable these sites, right? These are a textbook that hasn't been modified in four years, but doesn't need to be modified every year or right. whatever, yeah. uh, obviously. So it would be a little bit of a project, but um, but I think it would be theoretically possible, th theoretically easier to do in multi-site than in like cPanel because it is sharing a database. Um, but you have to be real careful with how you'd set that up, I think. There's also built in, and it's a, it's a strange tool, but it is a, a, just a button within your, multi, your network admin where you can click archive, which will essentially take that site offline, but keep the site as part of the WordPress multi-site. So in some ways, it's not making your database more efficient, and but the site is offline. But in terms of, what it would look like to go in and um, pull all the details from that site and archive it would be interesting. So are we talking about flat files? Are we talking about pulling those, the database and all that stuff? So it's like a full blown archive of that because the, the WordPress multi-site database is structured differently, right? So you could get the core like tables, but then the users is part of the global users. So some of that would be, custom but depending on whether you just want the flat files for that to live on whether you just want to have a dump of like here's an html version of the site that you can take with you you know professor x or student y or faculty member or z and that would be something so depending on what you want there are different possibilities i do know that brad koslick and cole camp lease back in the day at penn state did that like they built a tool that effectively took sites from their WordPress multi-site and packaged them up as HTML sites and said, here you go. Here's an HTML export of all your stuff. Thanks for you know shopping at PSU blogs. You know, we'll see you later. <laughs> Penn State's now campus press. They don't they, they don't do much custom anymore. That's right. Um, I added two um, plugins that I use in my multi-site. Uh, one is um, and I use it in conjunction with the um, back, you know, the downloading a zip file of your site. It's the um, export media library. So that's the one that grabs the media of the the user in the uh, in the actual <laughs> backup. And then the other one um, kind of goes to your question about how to know when the last time someone logged in or that sort of thing. It's called WP Last Login, and it's actually really helpful. It shows up in your administration uh, user um, uh, screen. So you can see when the last time somebody actually logged in and, and, and kind of helps you with cleaning up those user accounts that way.
And who was going to unmute first? That would be me. Yeah, so we're coming up. We have five minutes, but I'd wonder anyone else who's here, who manages a WordPress or like Steve, I know you talked about wanting to or thinking about bringing a WordPress multi-site. And if you are coming here kind of with advice or for advice about WordPress multi-site, like starting one, I think a few people can attest to this here in this group. Like one of the things I love about WordPress multi-site is literally you can do it on shared hosting. <laughs> it's a very easy like change, little change in the config and the network siting, and you go from a single site to a full-blown multi-site. And it doesn't have to be gigantic, neither in scale, right? Not until you get a ton of people publishing simultaneously. So Annika, I know you were saying um, you were thinking, or M, I think you were saying you were thinking about doing one, or maybe it's time to do one. The nice thing about WordPress multi-site is it's really a very simple switch you flick in a single WordPress that allows you to have multiple users. Um, and depending upon usage, even if you do subsites, subdirectories, it's really like you don't even have to worry about SSL certs. It's really simple. So um, if you're thinking about it and you want to experiment with something on campus, it's great and easy. The thing I would warn you about is it can explode and people are like, oh, great, I have the service. So then you have to like be in scale mode like okay, it's getting bigger and it's successful, which is good. I know, Lori, you can speak to the success you've had, Ed, many folks here, Robin. But like, if you're doing it, it could be a very useful tool on campus. So just be ready for that too when it starts to grow that there is. But luckily, I think it's manageable as a tool. Like even as a single admin, I think if you can manage WordPress, you're not that far away from being able to manage a full-blown WordPress multi-site for hundreds or even thousands of users. So that's my advice, Steve, if you're looking from other people here have a lot of great advice. They've been through this. But M, if you're imagining this as a potential useful tool, you've come to the right community with Reclaim to get help along the way. Because it is a very, I found it one of the most useful tools that we had on campus um, at my time as an ed tech, bar none. So I would add one thing about starting a multi-site on your campus <clears throat> or multi-site is do not go crazy on a ton of themes. Keep it restricted to just a few, some simple ones, and then some more that, it, you know, have more bells and whistles because I did that. And then it was really hard to scale back. And one thing we tell our users is that if, you know, oh, I don't particularly like these themes they have the right to go get their own WordPress instance and load up whatever themes and plugins they want to. So, I mean, that's the advice I'd give to you. Don't, don't go overboard with plugins and themes because you can really do it and get yourself in trouble. Oh yeah. I, I have conversations with a couple of faculty and students who have their own WordPress sites and say, be careful with the amount of plugins and themes you have in your, uh, WordPress instance, one, because it takes up storage. Second, every WordPress plugin is an additional database that you add and uh, can also have vulnerabilities to it if it's not kept up by the developer. And so the more plugins you have, the more vulnerabilities you have, and the more you have to upkeep your, your uh, website. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of keeping it low, low stakes, low scale, um, only a couple of things. My question is, if I do create this institution-wide WordPress site for ePortfolios, um, and we have some existing ePortfolios for students and faculty that we can move, um, I would need to create a redirection. Um, but does the site still, the original site still have to be active, like the C panel in which it was created in? Not for redirection. Um, as long as it's pointed, as long as the actual domain is pointed to the right place, then the C panel shouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, but. It kind of, it kind of depends, right? You need something to read, like, if you can do it in DNS, like you mm -hmm. can point the domain to the, the 
that existed over here to the new um, multi-site, you can totally map domains and that's super easy to do. But if it's something like you want the new URL, like there is a new URL, say it's mycoolsite.com and we move it to mycoolsite.wordpressmultisite.com and you want that to be the actual visible URL and you don't want to map the domain, sometimes there are times you want to do that. Um, you would probably need to keep the old cPanel in that instance. But for most of the part, you can you can map domains and multi-site. There's ways to do that. So. Uh, yeah, we'll need a separate conversation for that. Yeah, I would say also thinking about that and then thinking about what Lori was saying, bringing existing portfolios that people have already built out into a WordPress multi-site does prompt conversations about for people who have it installed all these plugins, all these themes, and who say, hey, no, I want to keep this available, you know, just in case, or no, I'm still using this. I want this to be part of the site. That does mean pulling it into the WordPress multi-site, and that does mean making it available for all of the users and thinking about what that ends up meaning for everybody. Yeah. And for you as an admin and long-term management. Yeah, if they have any themes or plugins that they were using that they want to keep, those will have to be part um, yeah. too. And also in my experience, a lot of users would say, well, no, it's not active right now. I'm not using it right now, but you know, I might change my mind. I want to keep it. I was, uh, Lori, you mentioned like the conversation of like, hey, you know, you can take, when you outgrow what you can do here, you can take it, your site and move it to a different place. Like, I always kind of loved those conversations because it was sort of like, a, hey, your project is like Blossoming. outgrown this little garden, right? And now it needs its own space. You can do things with this. Like it can be kind of tricky or at least, at least I always had anxiety around those when I first had those conversations of like, they're going to be mad or whatever that I can't help them. But like it, it, it matters so much the tone, right? And say like, okay, we, we can't offer that here, but here are really good options. This is where we can point you to to get started here's how moving it would look, you know, or, or maybe we'll help you with it depending on what you're able to offer. Um, and a lot of times people were kind of excited to take that next step and say like, Oh, and I'll be able to do like multiple sites if I want to and, and all this other stuff. And obviously then you get into whole, uh, not, and not everyone wants that of course, but um, I was surprised at how often that was actually like a really like energizing interaction and not like a, I'm sorry, I can't help you kind of thing. Yeah. Some I, people are also, sh uh, they shy away from a lot of options. Like if you are over ecstatic about all of the things that they can do, um, then they become a little intimidated by all the options that they have and tend to shy away from uh, exploration. Yeah, it's a fine line, right? I mean, I think making it simple too has its its real it's real power. I think that's why a lot of people kept with the classic editor and like, you know, it's 500, 5 million active installs and then another million for the classic widgets. Like there's something happening there. But I think beyond that, one of the things I've been doing lately, and it's very interesting as we talk about these legacy sites that have been going on for a while, like Lori, you have one. Um, I know Tom, who was on here before, have one. Many of us, Ed, you'll have one. Like, one of the things I've really started to realize is I just did a couple of big migrations of big sites that had lived on spaces like Rampages or UMW blogs. And it was cool. Like it can be work, but it was cool to see like these sites that have lived on these environments for years now need another home for various reasons. And I think the fact that these things get started as a part of a university effort to give people space to do this is no small kind of win in the work we do as a, as you know, as what, whatever we support at tech it, like it was pretty cool to kind of see these faculty build these resources and be like, I want it. Like I want it to live on. And if it's not working here, I need to move it somewhere else. So, you know, there's a lot of good that comes out of it and years in the making, I think, which is cool, but exporting WordPress, we have a great guide on it, but it is a different beast when you're going from WordPress multi-site to a single site. So keep that in mind as you do move people out. 
um, to keep all those database settings and the users. There's a bit of juggling, but it's not impossible. And we can always help if you have questions. We're uh, like five minutes over. So of course, if everyone, um, people have to go, um, you can um, feel free. Uh, <laughs> Not, I don't know. Um, not that you were forced anyway. Um, and uh, so I'm going to probably stick around as people trickle out, but it was really great having the conversation. I really appreciated talking to everyone, hearing various different ways, how people are using it, what they're thinking about. Um, this is awesome. Hope to see people uh, at future ones. The recording of this will be posted. It's in our, it'll be in our community forum. You'll see it there. So um, yeah, thank you all. I'm going to stop the recording now. So. Hey.